reading this morning from Genesis chapter 28, uh, verses 10 through 22. This is an account of uh, Jacob's experience. If you um, may recall that um, his mother suggested that, Jacob, this is a good time for you to leave home. Uh, You and your uh, Esau have had a terrible conflict. It was great deception. I think you better go and visit your uncle, uh, Laban. And so this is one of the incidents that happened on that particular journey. We're in Genesis chapter 28, beginning with verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood there above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust on the earth, and you will be spread out to the west and to the east to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head, set it up as a pillar, and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. When Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will watch over me on the journey I am taking, one will give me food to eat and clothes to wear, so that I return safely to my father's household, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone will that I have set up as a pillar will be the house of God. And all of, of that you give me, I will give you a tenth. May God continue to speak to us from his holy word. I don't think anybody ever really gets argued into the kingdom of heaven. we, we, we sort of developed this mentality that uh, we, we get the impression that if, if we just say the right words in the right way or we give the right information, then people will just be, uh, they will just believe. They will just come to faith because they'll have no choice. But it's not a matter of just how much information we give them. No one can be argued into the kingdom. Jesus himself said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them, and I will raise them up at the last day. Well, unless the Father draws them, there's nothing that we could do to bring them to God. Now, don't take that to mean that you shouldn't know how to present your faith. We should be able to give a reason for the hope that we have, as the scriptures say. We should we should be uh, aiming to do that. We should be training ourselves to do that. But at the same time, our hearts should be bent on praying for the people we share with, recognizing that that no matter what we do, no matter what efforts we give, the only way that it's going to have effect is if God reveals himself to them by his Holy Spirit. Apart from a personal encounter with God, no one's going to come to see God. 
It's his work. It's, a, it's an act of the Holy Spirit. It's a holy thing. So today we're going to talk about Jacob and his personal encounter with God and see what that reflects to us as well. But before we do that, let's bow our heads and our hearts for a word of prayer. Lord, we pray that you would come and speak to us now that you would reveal yourself to us. Lord, this isn't something we can bring about by the right sermon or the right music or anything else. We depend entirely on you. To make this real, you've got to show up. And so, Lord, that's what we pray for, that you would show up, not just, not just make it a better program, but touch our hearts and touch our lives. Lord, we know that your word is not just print on a page. And we've come in faith because we've come to hear not just stories and information or the right rules or moral lessons. We've come to encounter you. Your word is living and active, and we pray that you'd enliven our hearts, each of our hearts, as you visit us through your word. Hide the one who teaches behind the cross, that in this time we may hear the soft sound of sandal feet and, and know that we have been in your presence. For it is in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. We read in the book of Genesis about the call of Abraham. His name was Abram when he was called. God later renamed him Abraham, but when God called him, God said to him that he was going to bless him. He was going to give him a land. He, he told him to leave the place where he was living, where his family was, to leave that place and go to a land where he would show him and God would give him the land, that God would bless him. And not only that God would bless him, but that God would bless the entire world through Abraham. It was quite a promise, especially since it didn't happen for a long time. Uh, but Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abraham was already old, but it was some time later when God came back to him and reiterated the promises that he was going to make him into a great nation. He was going to bless him and bless the world through him. He was going to give him the land that he was on. And at this point, Abraham was 100 years old, 100 years old. Sarah was 90 now, we were talking in our, in, in our uh, Bible study that the, the praise team does in my office this morning about, uh, about uh, the fact that today, women in their 30s who are getting pregnant are, are considered high risk because of their age. And in their 40s, they're very high risk. And in their 50s, incredible high risk. Sarah was 90, past menopause, past all that stuff. It just seemed impossible, but Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And sure enough, Abraham's 100, Sarah's 90, and God gives them a son. One. One son, Isaac. God's promised to make him into a great nation. Well, it's a start, but it's a small start. It takes faith to believe God's promises. Then Isaac, who is the, the heir of the promise, uh, also gets those promises to himself from God. God comes to Isaac himself and, and reiterates those promises. Isaac and his wife, Rebekah, have two children. Okay, we doubled in number. It's not, not getting exponential yet. It doesn't seem like much of a nation yet. But again, it's a, it's a start. We're building. Instead of one, they get two children, two boys, twins. And these boys could not be any more different one from another. The first one that came out was Esau, and so he is the oldest. You're twins, but, you know, the first one out comes oldest because uh, the oldest is going to get the rights of the firstborn. Jacob is, is clinging to his brother, grasping his heel as he comes out. And so he, he comes out riding on his brother's heel. And they name him, he, he grasps the heel which is what Jacob means. But it's really an idiom because that, that idiom means to deceive. When one grasps the heel was, was just a way of saying he deceives. Not much of a name, really. 
But Abraham spends the first part of his life living up to his name as a deceiver. Sometime later, and I told you uh, Esau was the oldest, and as the oldest, he had the birthright of the firstborn, which meant he got a double portion of the inheritance. One day, uh, when Esau was out in the fields, now again, they were very different people. Esau uh, came out really hairy, I mean ape-like. He was really hairy. Um, and, and, and as he grew up, he, he loved to hunt and he, you know, he was a, he was a man's man. He was an outdoor man, loved to be out in the fields. Jacob was a mama's boy. He liked to be home, uh, to tend to the flocks, stay in the tents. Uh, well, later on, Esau has been out hunting all day, didn't catch anything. He comes in and, and Jacob, uh, has been watching the cooking channel, and he's made this great stew, and it smells great throughout the tent. And, and Esau is famished. He's been, you know, trying to catch something all day, but he didn't catch anything. And he's, he, he comes in, he says, Jacob, give me some of that stew. That smells great. I want some of that. And, and, he's, and uh, Jacob says to him, that again, Jacob, he's the deceiver. He's a conniver. He says to Esau, listen, I, I'll trade you this stew for your birthright. That, that's a big trade. But Esau is hungry. And he says, what good is my birthright if I starve to death? If I'm dead, it doesn't do me any good. Give me some of the stew. Jacob says, swear to it. Esau swears to it. I don't know why. He wasn't very smart. He was a man's man, but he wasn't very smart. And I don't think the elevator went all the way to the top floor. Because he traded his birthright for stew. So, so Jacob has cheated his brother out of his birthright. Sometime later, when Isaac is very old, very, very old, and he knows he's about to die, uh, he's mostly blind, and he can't see, and, and he recognizes time is short, and so he calls Esau his firstborn. And there are really two things that, that went to the, uh, to the firstborn. The first was the birthright and the inheritance. The second was a blessing. Now, we think of a blessing as just a good word, you know, a nice thing to say about someone. But in ancient times, there was something to this blessing, something that I can't even, I, I can't even explain. But it, it wasn't just a good word, but there seemed to be some kind of power in this. It, was, it wasn't even just a prophecy of, of this is what, we, what will come. But, but through this blessing, there came a blessing. Somehow, maybe God uh, honored what was given as the blessing of the firstborn. It was a big deal. And so uh, Isaac, wanting to give this blessing to Esau, his firstborn, uh, sends Esau out. He says, Esau, go out and, and catch me some of that game that I love. Uh, you know, hunt me down something, make it into a feast for me and bring it in. And when I've eaten, I want to give you my blessing. This, this is a big deal thing. Um, and now, you, you need to know as well, Isaac really loved Esau. Esau was his favorite. He was a man's man. Jacob, like I said, was a mama's boy, and he was Rebekah's favorite. Well, Rebekah heard Isaac send Esau out to get game so that he could get his blessing. And so she starts conniving with Jacob. She says, Jacob, quick, go out into the flock and get two young goats and bring them in and I'll prepare them just the way your father loves them. And then you'll present them and pretend to be Esau and you can get his blessing. And Jacob says, Mom, what are you thinking? I'm not anything like Esau. Esau is really hairy. What if my father touches me? And Esau smells like the outdoors. I don't smell like Esau. My father will recognize that. Even if he can't see me, he's going to know I'm not Esau. And I don't sound like Esau. Hi, Dad, I'm Esau. You know, I'm going to, I kind of have to sound different. If Rebecca says, if he curses you, I'll take it on myself, but you go and do what I told you to do. And so they prepare the goat and, uh, and, and, and uh, Rebecca, I got the right woman here. Uh, Rebecca then uh, helps him to to carry off this this deceit. She takes the goat skin. She makes gloves, long gloves that'll cover the arms of Jacob. Now, I mean, I told you he was hairy like an ape. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, but she wants him to be like, like Esau, so goatskin's going to do it. Uh, and she puts goatskin on his back, and she takes some of Esau's best clothes that smell like Esau, and she puts them on Jacob. So Jacob goes in to present it to his father, says, Father, here's the, the, uh, the wild game that you asked for, and I prepared it just the way you like it. And Isaac, he's blind, but he's not stupid. It, who are you? I'm your son, Esau. He said, mm, you sound like Jacob. Come here, let me feel you. And so he touches him, and somehow goatskin convinces him that he's Esau, and he smells his, his son's uh, outfit, and he says, ah, my son smells like the fields outside. And, uh, and he's convinced that it's Esau, and he blesses Jacob in Esau's place. Jacob goes out, and no sooner is he out of the tent, Esau, who has caught something, now comes into the tent and says, Father, I brought you the wild game just as you asked for. Now you can give me your blessing. And at this point, uh, Isaac is crestfallen. He, he is, is just horrified. He said, well, who was that that just came in here? I, so, somebody came in here. I gave them your blessing. Somehow he couldn't give two blessings. There was only one to give. There was a, a power in this blessing. It could only be given once. He said, there's nothing left for you. Esau was livid, as you can imagine. You know, he'd cheated, been cheated out of his birthright. He, and now his, his, brother, his brother has stolen his blessing. It's all he had left. And so he, he begins to talk about killing Jacob. He says, as soon as my father is dead, I'm going to kill my brother. Word gets back to, to Rebecca, and of course, Jacob's her favorite, and she, she says, I, I need to send you away from here so you'll be safe. Hey, have you ever seen the movie, the big, My Big Fat Greek Wedding? Some of you have seen that movie, and, and in that movie, uh, Thea, the daughter, wants to take a college course, and she asks her father's permission, and her father just kind of grumbles at her and says, no way. Um, and she's really upset. Her mother comes over to her. She says, why are you so upset? She, she says, I really want to take this course, and Dad won't let me. And, and, and her mother says, don't worry. I'll talk to your father. I'll work it out. And she says to her mother, but Mom, Dad is just impossible. And, and you know, he's the man, the head of the household. Her mother says, yeah, he is the head. But the woman, she's the neck. And she can turn the head in whatever direction she chooses. <laughs> well, that's just what we see happening here with Rebecca and Isaac. Rebecca wants to send Jacob away so he'll be safe. But it's not something she really has the power to do as a woman in that day and age. That was something her husband has to do. Uh, and, and, and like uh, Thea's mother, who, who convinces the father not only to send the daughter to college, but somehow makes it happen in such a way that he thinks it was his idea in the first place. Well, Rebecca does that with Isaac. She says to him, you know, these Hittite women, the women, the local women, because you remember they've moved from far away in Haran, and, and they've come, and these, these women are foreigners. They're different. And she says to him, if my son Jacob marries one of these local women, my life will not be worth living. Oh, the drama. Well, Isaac loves Rebecca. He wants to please her. And so he brings Jacob in and says, hey, I've got an idea for you. And he says, I'm going to send you to Haran, to, to the land of our people, so you can get a wife from among our own family. And so he sends him off uh, back to Haran. And, and that's where our story comes in today that, that Woody read for us a few moments ago. It's on that journey to flee from his brother Esau and to go to the land of uh, Laban, his uncle, uh, Rebekah's brother, that he is now on a journey. The journey will take him a good month because Haran is 550 miles away from Beersheba, where they were living. But on the route, several days out, some 60 miles away, uh, Jacob stops for the night. The sun's going down. It's time to stop traveling. So he lays down to go to sleep. He gets this great big stone, and he sets it down as a pillow. I guess Jacob was a little tougher than we thought. 
and he falls asleep and he has a dream. Now, in ancient times, a dream was not something that was taken lightly. Uh, it was recognized that God spoke to people in their dreams, and they took that very, uh, very seriously, as, as many people still do today. Uh, Muslims uh, will, will uh, pay great attention to, to dreams and, and what those dreams mean to their lives. Uh, many people have been to, led to Christ through their dreams. Uh, and so Jacob lays down, and he, he has this dream, and in the dream, he sees what appears to be a, a staircase with its, with its bottom set on the world and the top reaching up into heaven. And God is at the top of the staircase and the angels are going down and coming up, bringing messages from God or bringing messages back to God. They're, uh, they're waiting on God. Jacob is given a glimpse into the inner workings of the kingdom of heaven. And from the top of the staircase, God speaks to Jacob, and he first of all introduces himself. I am the God of Abraham. I am the God of Isaac. I am the God who gave the promises to your father and to your grandfather. He makes himself known, and then he reaffirms those promises now to Jacob. This promise is now going to be brought through Jacob, who, who stole the birthright, who stole the blessing, but who, who receives by grace the blessing and the promises of God. Um, God speaks to him and, and reaffirms that that land that he is now on, that he's sleeping on, it will all belong to, to his descendants, that he will have descendants as, as numerous as the stars in the sky, as, as numerous as the sand on the seashore, as, as uncountable, and that not only will God bless him, but God will bless the entire world through his offspring. That's the word we see in the English. The word in the, in the uh, Hebrew was seed, and it's a singular word because God has already planted the seed of the gospel. Because it is through the one descendant uh, of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, of, of David, the descendant who, who was Jesus, who came uh, as God in the flesh to bring salvation, to be a blessing to the whole world. So it is Jesus who is that seed that God is already promising at this point to be a blessing to the world, the seed and a blessing that we ourselves would receive. And I think about this at this point, I, I wonder why does God choose to reveal himself to Jacob at this point in his life? Has Jacob done anything to impress God, do you suppose? Does he have any merits or achievements that, that would cause God to show up at this particular moment? Quick review. Jacob, the deceiver, has lived up to his name. He's, he's cheated, he's lied, he's stolen. It's all been about him. He's very selfish. He has nothing to sell himself to God at this point. But isn't that the point? You know, so many of us think that we've got to have our ducks all in a row, that we've got to have our life together and that's the point in our life when, when we'll come to God or God will come to us and we'll make that connection. I was talking with somebody this week and they, were, they, they had mentioned that they were trying to invite someone that, uh, uh, that they know, a friend, to come back to church. They hadn't been to church in years and years, but they'd grown up in the church. And, uh, and the friend's response was, well, if I came into the church, the roof would cave in. And we've all heard that before. Um, Imagine that God would be so surprised to see us. God sees us all the time. God, see, God sees us in all the things that we're doing. Uh, do, do we think that our sins are going to somehow surprise him? Or I hear people say, I'm too bad. God wouldn't want me. How bad is too bad? Just how bad would we have to be to shock God? Do you suppose our sins shock God? Maybe in the sense that they shock him enough that he sent his son into the world to redeem us from those sins. But having sent his son into the world, the sacrifice of Christ has infinite value to cover any sin and all sin. So that there is no one who's too bad, no one who's too far away, no one who's too distant from God. 
And the truth of the matter is that even if we turned ourselves around and tried to chase God down and find him, we couldn't do it unless God decided to reveal himself to us. God decides to reveal himself to Jacob at this point. God is a God of love. We, we read in 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 to 10, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. God is a God of love. He is a God of forgiveness. He is a God of redemption. But when God comes to us, he doesn't come and, and, and sort of acquiesce to our sin. He, he doesn't just accept our sin or go along with our sin. He doesn't accommodate our sin. God has overcome sin by the cross of Jesus Christ. A great p price has been paid in order to overcome that sin. And God's desire is to overcome that sin in us personally, to make us like him, to make us holy. God says, be holy because I am holy. The only way that can happen is if God does a work in us. I love something that I uh, ran across that C.S. Lewis wrote in his book, Mere Christianity. He said, people often think of Christian morality as a kind of bargain in which God says, if you keep a lot of rules, I'll reward you. And if you don't, I'll do the other thing. C.S. Lewis says, I don't think that's the best way of looking at it. I would much rather say that every time you make a choice, you are turning the central part of you, the part of you that chooses, into something a little different than it was before. And taking your life as a whole with all your innumerable choices, all your life long, you are slowly turning this central thing into a heavenly creature or a hellish creature. Either a creature that is in harmony with God and with other creatures and with itself. To be the, the one kind of creature is heaven. Or... A creature that is in a state of war and hatred with God and with its fellow creatures and with itself. To be the one kind of creature is heaven. That is its joy and peace and knowledge and power. To be the other means madness, horror, idiocy, rage, impotence, and eternal loneliness. Each of us at each moment is progressing to the one state or the other. God makes himself known to Jacob. And up to this point in his life, Jacob has been the other. He has been that, that person whose choices have made him more the hellish creature. But God reveals himself to Jacob and something changes. And we see in the, in the stories that come ahead, Jacob is a person who ha has great integrity in the whole process. God is turning things around because God is, is sending Jacob the deceiver to an even greater deceiver, his uncle Laban, who will cheat him out of his wages, who will attempt to, when he notices that God is blessing him, he'll attempt, attempt to get those blessings for himself, who will uh, make Jacob work for seven years to, to gain a wife, Rachel, who he loves. And on his wedding night, Will, will switch and give his daughter Leah, who Jacob is not really all that in love with, and, and, and switches her as a bride. And so Jacob has to work another seven years in order to get the bride that he wants. He's getting cheated all over the place by this Laban, by this, this uncle. But somehow Jacob himself is, is, is different. God has promised to bless him, and Jacob is content to see how that unfolds as God brings it about. He doesn't feel like he has to cheat and lie and deceive or, or 
scrape his way up the corporate ladder in order to get himself ahead. He knows that God is the one that's going to make this happen. There's been a life change. God has made himself known personally to Jacob beyond any arguments, beyond any, any information that he might have had before. The truth of the matter is God is calling every one of us into a personal relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. And, and we, at some point, must respond to that and decide where are we on that staircase, that what used to tr traditionally be called Jacob's ladder. Where, where do we stand on that? And what direction are we going to face? Really, it's not so much about where we are on that, because we may start at any particular point. But when God makes himself known to us, we need to choose a direction. You see, you can't, you can't be moving up and moving down at the same time. God and the world are at polar opposites. And you've got to choose one way or another. And we all start off facing toward the world. We all want the things that the world wants. But when God makes himself known to us, he says, turn around. And see what I have for you. Turn around and come toward me. Turn around and choose life instead of death. That, that turning around we have a, a term for in the church is called repentance. It means to just turn yourself around. It means to, to, to let go of the things that you have been aiming towards and aim towards the things that God is, is calling you to. So it's not so much where you are in that ladder, but so more important where you're facing. Are you turned around? Are you facing God? Have you repented? The Apostle Peter needed a personal touch from God. He needed a personal encounter. Now, he had seen Jesus speak in the synagogue. He'd seen Jesus do miracles. He saw him as a miracle worker. As, as you and I probably would look at a great music, magician and go, well, that was entertaining. That was really cool. Jesus had even healed Peter's mother-in-law. But somehow it, it doesn't catch for Peter until it hits him in something that he's really, that he really relates to. Peter's a fisherman. He knows fishing. And, and God uses that. Jesus uses that to, to turn him around. He, he's had some time with Jesus, but he's not quite a follower of Jesus yet. And after spending all night out fishing and catching nothing, he's out you know, spreading out his nets and drying out his nets and stuff like that. And Jesus comes along and says, uh, Peter, you need to get back in the boat, go out in the deep water, put the nets down for a catch of fish. And Peter's thinking, huh, okay, the carpenter is telling me, the fisherman, how to fish. All right, if you say so, Lord, I'll do it. And he goes out and he can't believe it. He puts those nets down and there are so many fish that the nets are starting to tear. And he calls his partners in the other boat. They bring another boat out. They haul in these nets. There are so many fish that both boats are so loaded that they're almost sinking. And it's at that point that Peter responds. We read in Luke 5, 8, when Simon, Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Somehow, Jesus had touched him to the core because Peter saw him in a new light. Peter, Peter somehow had, had, had been related to in something that, that he understood. Uh, Bill Hull, in, in a book, New Century Discipleship, writes this about that encounter. He says, this was the response of a guilty man. One who was fighting serious doubt. Peter had been ready to drop out, and Jesus knew it. But now Peter realized how foolish he had been to doubt his master. He had seen Jesus' power before, but this time the master broke through in a new way. For there in that boat, the power of God was made real in Peter's chosen field of endeavor. What happens in Peter's, what happened in Peter's life happens to many different people in various areas of life. A businessman may attend church for years, faithful in attendance, dil diligent to serve whenever called upon, and generous with his material treasure, and yet somehow he fails to experience the reality of Christ in his business. And then difficult times put pressure on his marketplace existence, so 
He comes up with a, mo- mo- a novel idea. Pray. As in the case of Peter, when God comes through for you, for, for you, it's like experiencing him in a way you never expected. When this kind of liberating experience takes place, you can gain confidence to commit everything to Christ. Only when you place all areas of your life in his hands can the abundant life begin. Eternal life is found in Jesus Christ. Heaven is all about relationship with him. In fact, Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Jacob had been living for himself to this point, but God reveals himself not to affirm his sin, but to redirect him. He doesn't do it by by giving him the rules, and he doesn't do it by just giving him information, but by making himself known, by a personal encounter that makes it all real. I'm sure that that Isaac and probably Abraham as well have told Jacob and Esau all about the promises that God gave them. I mean, that's not something you hide from your children. After all, it's going to come down through them. So this is something that would be celebrated in the family. But probably didn't mean a whole lot to him, except that he said, okay, we're going to get blessed. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna be this great nation. I want that blessing. So he, he starts to do it on his own. But he only really becomes an heir, not when he's taking measures himself to bring it about, but when he recognizes that this is the gift of God for him. We also are heirs of God's promises. Not because we deserve it, not because we are, uh, are, are legally in line for, for the blessing, but because of God's grace. I want you to consider a couple of verses from from the New Testament. Romans 4, 13 to 16 tells us, It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be the heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing and the promise is worthless, because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there's no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith so that it may be so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, not only to his legal descendants, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. And then in Galatians 3, beginning at verse 26, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You are heirs according to the promise. God promised Abraham that he would be with him. The greatest greatest, uh, blessing of scripture. Jesus tells us, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. God says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. We're, We're heirs of that promise. He says, I will bless you and through the whole world... You, you will bring a blessing to the whole world. Well, God fulfilled that in Abraham by sending Jesus, the seed of Abraham, but he fulfills it in us as well because he makes us heirs and he makes us a blessing to the world because we also are able to invite people to eternal life. We are able to invite people to be partakers of the promise, to come into the family, to be adopted in the family of God, to become heirs with Christ of the promises of God. It became real to Jacob when he experienced it at that, at that staircase and God made himself known and something changes in him. It becomes personal at that point. It's not just the family story. It's now his story. It now defines who he is. We see uh, in our passage today, beginning at verse 20, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey I'm taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return safely to my father's ho- household, then the Lord will be my God. 
my God. And this stone that I've set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. It all became real to Jacob when God made himself known to him. Let me ask you, has it become real to you? Has God made himself known to you? God tells us that if we turn to him in faith, that he will make himself known to us. John proclaims in his gospel, no one has ever seen God, but the one and only son who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the father has made him known. God has made him known to us, himself known to us through the person of Jesus Christ who came in the flesh as someone that we could see and hear and touch. And the testimony about him is given, but Jesus who died on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins was raised from the, from the dead by the power of God that we might know him by the power of God, that it might be personal, that God might reveal himself to us through him. Most of you know I grew up in the church. I went to church, not because I wanted to go to church, but because my family went to church. My family went to church, and I had to go to church. My family believed that there was a God. My grandparents believed it. My parents believed it. So I guess I believed it. But I didn't care. It didn't really mean much to me. It was just stories and, you know, moral morality stories and bedtime stories. And it didn't mean much. But I think I've told you also about Mrs. Pottle, who when we were in the seventh grade taught our class about the Gospel of John. And I can't tell you the lessons that she taught us. I, I don't know what she taught us in particular. But I know that God was in her. And God was making himself known through her. That we didn't just hear about God. We saw God's presence in this lady. And she kept inviting us into the kingdom. And it was when I came to know him that everything changed, everything made sense. It wasn't just I went to church because it was my parents' church. It was my church. It wasn't their faith. It was my faith. It had become personal. You see, there's, there's no argument that's going to bring you to the kingdom. But once you have seen the Lord, once you have been introduced to the Lord, once he has made himself known to you, once Jacob saw God at the top of that staircase, you can't unsee that. You know it's true. And no matter what arguments come down the path, you know that God is still God. And he'll figure out the arguments. We'll figure out the information. But it's personal. We know who he is. And you can't unsee that. Let's pray. As we come to prayer, I want to invite you, if you have a prayer for any reason, when, 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 we, uh, when we sing a song, we're going to invite you, if you just want somebody to pray for you, then uh, we, we'd invite you to come and sit in one of the front pews and someone will come and pray for you. But this morning, as we, as, as we turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer, if you've never met the Lord, if you know about him but don't know him, then this morning is, is the time to say, Lord, I, I want to believe in you. Give me the faith to believe in you, and, and by faith I will turn to you. Oh. Maybe, maybe you find yourself dancing on the stairs, that, that you're facing in one direction for a little while, and then you start shuffling down a bit and going towards the world and and maybe today you, you need to do another turnaround, uh, repent, and be facing him again this morning. This morning is the time to do that, to say, Lord, I, I know who you are. I, I don't want to face away from you. I don't want to turn my back to you. I, I want to turn towards you. I want to come close. I want to become like you. I want to become your person. And, and today's the day to turn that around. If, if you haven't had that personal encounter, the, I know that today God is speaking to your heart. God speaks to us through his word, and, and he's been speaking today, and, and maybe you've heard him for the first time today. And, and if that's the case, don't, don't, 
Don't turn a deaf ear to the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found and call on him while he is near. Turn to him in faith. Because God has, has given us his word. He has shown us himself in, in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who came. Yeah, he came a long time ago. But he, he was witnessed by the world. He came in history that we might know him. He came to die for our sins that we might be forgiven and cleansed from all unrighteousness and turned toward the Lord. God raised him from the dead and we can know him. And he invites you today to turn to him. Lord, we thank you that it's not about the right information and about the rules, but it's about you. We thank you that you've made yourself known to us. Lord, help each of us to turn ourselves totally to you, to, to give ourselves completely to you in all that we do and all that we are, for we know that you are God. You are our God, and we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter,